Hello everyone and welcome to Golden Artist Colors. I'm Kevin Greeland. Today we're going to be talking about surface preparation. Um, before we get started on that, we have a material application specialist who can answer your questions in the chat. So if you come up with a question that we haven't addressed, make sure you put it in the chat and we'll try and answer it there. You can also email us at help at goldenpaints.com. And we've created a landing page for you which has some additional information. You can find that landing page in the description of the event. Um, again, we're going to be looking at surface preparation, so let's switch to our overhead camera. And first up, we're going to be talking about gesso. And so you can think of gesso kind of as the bridge between what you're painting on and what the paint is going on. It's the connective tissue between your substrate and um, your paint. And so in this case, we have our gesso. We've applied some here nice and smooth, and then we've tinted it with yellow. And so um, we used uh, the India yellow hue. So you can see because this is nice and white, you get a little of a pastel tone there. But now this is prepped and ready, and we can start painting directly on this surface. Um, if you're the kind of person that likes it nice and smooth, you have that option, or you can create some texture. And that texture can be created with a palette knife or a brush. I can drop some of the gesso on there, and we'll kind of demo that for you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, so um, first up, we're going to look at our fluid. So I'm just going to apply, um, this happens to be again the India Yellow, so I'm going to apply the India Yellow Hue right across there. And as I said, the gesso is just really preparing your painting surface to receive the paint. It's the bridge or connective tissue. Um, and so this is with our um, fluid India Yellow, and then I'm also going to use a little bit of high flow. And the high flow is the green gold here. And I'm, again, I'm just going to brush that on there. Uh, again, smooth or textured um, is up to you. And how much texture you build up there is a little bit dependent on the gesso. You can see we were able to create some, but you don't get a lot. Um, and um, here is a little bit of a, a watercolor. This happens to be our watercolor and this is ultramarine blue violet um, and also just generally drawing and mark making on there so that is our gesso and we'll take a look at the next one so you'll see a lot of times there's talk about grounds and what, what does grounds mean and for us, um, we're just using that term ground as, the again, just like the gesso, it's kind of that connective tissue between your surface and what you want to do on that surface. In this particular case, I've uh, applied our pastel ground to a piece of plexiglass here. And it creates kind of a light tooth. If I run my finger over there, you can hear that tooth. Again, this is the pastel ground. Um, and I'll go ahead and apply um, some paint. So again, if I want to do um, water media or just paint directly on there, I can. But the pastel ground gives you this nice tooth, so it works great for colored pencil and, of course, chalk pastels and even our oil pastels. So any type of mark making, um, this, the pastel ground is ideal for that. And again, if I was starting my painting, I might put my gesso down, and then I'd put down my pastel ground onto my surface, and then I could start painting or drawing on that. I can draw on this with a pencil as well. I can use my charcoal on there. So that one is pastel ground. So all of these, like the gesso, the pastel ground is, again, it's just a ground. It's a connecting bridge between what you're painting on and what you're going to do on the top. So pastel ground. The next one we're going to look at is our absorbent ground. And that one 
looks like this. Um, and a great, this is great for water media effects. Here I've tinted it. In this case, I tinted it with just a few drops of our alizarin crimson hue fluid. And uh, I scraped it down because you can see, unlike the pastel ground, this one is much more opaque. Um, but again, it's just preparing my surface and making it receptive to my mark making. So here I'm just using our fluid color. Um, uh, and the fluid color is the Indian yellow hue. But if I wanted to go back and introduce some water, I can do that. And this uh, surface is super absorbent. You can kind of just see how that paint moves on that surface. I can do the same thing with the high flow. And again, if I wanted to introduce a little bit of water, I can go back and really stretch that out across that surface and create a nice little wash. Uh, again, for watercolor, this happens to be our core, ultramarine blue violet. Um, again, if I introduce a little bit of clean water, you can see how nice and absorbent that is and just moves across the surface. And uh, the nice part about this is if I wanted to tint it, I can do that. And that's what I've done on the top half. So that is our absorbent ground. The next one that we're going to take a look at is our Silver Point Drawing Ground. The Silver Point Drawing Ground is kind of unique. We've uh, applied that to this panel here. And you can use, you know, a metal stylus um, to draw on here. You could use even something like a paper clip to make your marks on there, or even a little piece of still wool. So all uh, different marks. And then you can also tint it. And it's a beautifully smooth surface, so I can use my pencil on there as well. I could use my colored pencils. Or again, a metal stylus, such as this. So that is our silver point drawing ground. And again, all of these have different uh, applications. So you make sure you read the back of the directions. This is our fine pumice gel. And somewhat similar to the pastel ground in terms of how it looks, it also has a nice tooth to it. Uh, and so on here, I've tinted this one again with a little bit of that Indian yellow hue. Uh, and here it is untinted. I can show you um, what that looks like on a thick application. You see it's kind of very opaque, but if I spread it very thin, I can get it to be translucent. And that is the fine pumice. I'll spread this out across there. And so you can see if it's real thin, it will, when it dries, it will still give me the tooth that I need, um, but uh, it will be translucent. And again, a beautiful surface to uh, do some mark making on. And that's whether it's uh, a fluid or a high flow color. Um, it could be watercolor. And again, works well with, for mark making, whether I'm using a pencil or a colored pencil. It has a real nice tooth to it, and so it'll really hold those um, mark making lines from the pencil and colored pencil. In addition to some of the grounds, things that we actually call grounds, like pastel ground or absorbent ground. Um, gels and paste, other mediums can function like a ground and are great for mark making and prepping your surface. So this happens to be our light molding paste. And here I've prepped my surface using black gesso. So you can kind of see that white molding paste. And then again, I tinted it here 
with a fluid, just one drop, alizarin crimson hue. Because this is white, it kind of goes to that pastel. If I put a little bit of the paint directly out there, you can kind of see that. And then if I brush that around and use a real wet brush, it's also fairly absorbent. Now, the thing to remember, the more paint I mix with this, uh, the less absorbent it's going to become. Um, but I could easily use my fluid color. I can use my high flow color on there. Um, and I can do some mark making with a pencil, um, chalk pastel or oil pastel, just like we did before, um, and my watercolor. And so this is our core watercolor on there. So I'm able to make all sorts of marks on this surface. If I want a lot of texture, I can build that texture up, and I can paint on top of that as well. I can mix it with my paint or paint on top. So the nice thing about this one is you can create quite a bit of texture, um, and it's super lightweight. So that is our light molding paste. Again, lots of texture, fairly absorbent. It looks like we have some questions there. Hi. Yes. Um, I do want to reiterate, too, before I ask this question, that if you are joining us a little late, that's no problem. These events are recorded, and you can come back and watch them at your convenience. Um, and also that we have created a landing page with resources about this topic. It's available at the top of the chat and also the video description. So. Um, there's lots of great resources there if you're looking for something about um, this topic. So one question we got is, um, oh, can you scroll back up to that question? Um, do you still suggest framing when working on these prepared grounds for drawing media and watercolor? Yes, to, to put the finished work in a frame. Yes, the finished work could go in a frame. Um, I, I think um, definitely with these, I would follow up with varnishing as well. So whatever you're doing on that surface, make sure you're following the directions for its application. They're slightly different for some of them, light molding paste you don't want to use with oils. So make sure you read the back. Um, but yes, once you're done creating your image or your painting, um, you can varnish that surface and you can have it framed. Hopefully that gets your question answered and uh, our material application specialist will also drop some information in there. Um, in that landing page, we have a very in-depth um, article that cover, uh, covers surface preparation, so make sure you read that and check that out as well. All right, so with this, this is just kind of a light cursory look at some of the items or products that you can use uh, for mark making and creating texture on your surface. And this one was our light molding paste. Um, opaque, um, but um, I'm able to tint it. And so along with the light molding paste, we're going to look at another paste. This one is our coarse molding paste. And so unlike the light molding paste, this one is a little grittier um, and it's coarse. Um, so when you do the colored pencil on there, you can really hear that texture. It has quite a bit of tooth on that. Um, and that's with, you know, just a regular drawing pencil. Here's colored pencil. Again, the product, when you apply it, it is an opaque white paste. So you can see that right there. But as it dries, it does become a little translucent um, if you apply it very thinly. And it can be tinted. Uh, again, in this particular case, I tinted it using our fluid alizarin crimson. Um, I can paint on this as well with our fluids, our heavy body or our high flow. Um, and this is with the watercolor. So all of these, which one you would choose, just kind of depends on the type of technique or surface that you're after. They'll each give you slightly different effects. There's a little detail for you.
Um, and as I said, you can create quite a bit of texture and you can mix these products with your paint or you can paint on top of those. The next product that we're going to look at is also another paste. And this is our molding paste. And that is this product. Uh, Semi-opaque texture medium. Um, it's very tight and smooth. So unlike the other two that we just looked at that had um, a very coarse and kind of gritty surface, um, this one's very fine. And that has to do with the marble dust that we're adding to that. Um, again, you can mix the, the um, paste with a color, which is what I've done here with the alizarin crimson hue. You can create quite a bit of texture. Now, unlike the molding paste where it really pulled in or let's say the absorbent uh, ground, which really pulled that color in, um, here, this one's very slick and smooth. Um, but again, I'm able to paint um, fine detail on there using fluids, high flow, or even my heavy body. And a little bit of watercolor. Um, I can use my mark making tools for pencil or even oil pastel. So lots of options there as well. So if you want something that's, you know, very gritty, you can go with the coarse molding paste. If you want something super absorbent and a little bit of texture, you can go with something like the light molding paste, which is this one. Or if you want a nice, smooth, kind of tight surface, then just go with the molding paste. Again, all of these provide different options for you for drawing and painting. Um, these grounds are really um, just the receptacle to receive what you're drawing and painting on there. And so this one is our crackle paste. Um, as I said, maybe right before we lost our audio, um, you don't have a lot of control over the cracking. There's a couple of different factors there, uh, humidity, uh, what you're applying it to, um, evaporation, all sorts of things. Um, fairly thin though, you will get um, smaller cracks, a little bit thicker, you get bigger cracks. Um, this is a nice absorbent surface. There are a few caveats with this in that you want to apply it to a sturdy surface um, on a canvas. These little cells would have a tendency to pop off. But even that you can manipulate uh, once you're done painting by putting um, perhaps a gloss medium or matte medium over top. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to use a little water and just wet the surface so you can look at absorbency and we'll use a little bit of uh, fluid. This is our in India yellow. Um, and so if I put a lot on there, it's going to have a tendency to fill those cracks in. If I put a little on or do like a water media kind of wash over there, you can see I can get some really nice subtle color. If I wanted, I could paint these individual cells and really kind of almost go mosaic style by painting each individual little cell. So it really depends what you're after in terms of which one you might want to use. Um, we'll just put a little of the uh, high flow on there. And this is our green gold uh, high flow. Uh, and it looks like that, green gold high flow. And I'm just going to apply a little bit along this little edge here and then I'm going to get some water and kind of move that and spread it out. If you wanted to, you could equally draw on this surface. So if I wanted to, I could, you know, highlight some particular cells and then go back and paint that one a particular color. Um, so you have lots of options there. Uh, again, you can create quite a bit of texture. Um, just uh, remember that this is opaque. We'll scoop a little bit out and you'll see it just looks like a white paste on its own. Um, there's no cracking in that. That will happen once it dries. If I wanted to tint this one, I could tint this a little bit. Um, again, read the directions. Um, if you introduce too much paint or binder, you 
can uh, inhibit its ability to crack. So you can see here, I've tinted it with a little bit of our fluid. And then if I allow this to dry overnight, this would crack just like the rest of um, the paste here by itself. That's white. So that is our crackle paste. The next one up is one of my favorites. It's my caseous iron oxide. And uh, that's this one, the product, my caseous iron oxide. Uh, the product is applied by itself here at the top. And then I tinted it a little bit with the alizarin crimson hue. Um, you can, again, it has a nice tooth to it. So it's great for colored pencil. I'm going to go over this and you can hear that texture a little bit. So it really grabs on to, there's a nice tooth to it, a little bit like an emery board there. Um, so great for colored pencil or drawing applications. If I wanted to, I could use my fluid or high flow on there and paint on this surface. I could also mix this with my paint. As I said on the bottom, I tinted it with just a few drops of this alizarin crimson hue. You can see you'd, if you really want to affect the color, you're going to have to add a lot because it is so dark. And I'll pull a little bit of this out. Um, so this is the product wet. And you can see if I spread that on there, um, fairly close to the color. There is a little shift as it dries. Um, and this is a hematite ore that's actually ground up and suspended in there. Um, and you can see, if I hold this in the light a little bit, you can see kind of some of that ore, that little green, gray kind of sparkle. So this is my caseous iron oxide. Creates a great tooth for drawing on, can be mixed with your paints, or you can paint on top. Micaceous iron oxide. And we have uh, two more to look at for acrylics, and then we'll talk a little bit about some watercolor ground as well. So this one I just put in, this is kind of fun. This is clear granular gel. Again, this is a product that you could mix with your paint or you could apply it to your painting surface. So here I've painted the, my board uh, Naples yellow hue first, and then I've applied my clear granular gel. It's kind of a milky white when wet, but it has these large or regular sized uh, acrylic beads in there. And so when that dries, it goes to this kind of translucent surface. Um, and you can, I'm going to take a pencil on there. It has a lot of texture. So you can hear all that texture. Um, but you get really nice kind of water media effects if I use a little bit of my watercolor on there. You can see it's quite irregular. So if I add a little bit of water, I can move that around. And then if I do the same thing with our fluid, this is our fluid. But you can see all those little cells on there, um, how that paint moves around. If I introduce even more water, I can kind of wash over that surface and kind of fill it in. But I like having all that texture in there. Uh, it's a good way of getting your color washed and mixed together. So this is the green gold in the high flow. If I introduce more water, I can spread that across the surface. So this is just a fun one. This is our clear granular gel. Milky white when wet. When it dries, it goes to this translucent gel that has acrylic beads in there and lots of texture. So you can see there I put some watercolor now running over the surface and some high flow and some fluid. All right, the next one, a little bit like the micaceous iron oxide, this one's on the dark side. It is our coarse alumina, a very textured surface. I'll spread a little out, wet. And so you can see this one has a bigger color shift. Here it is wet. And then when it dries, it will look like this. Um, it provides a lot of texture, a lot of tooth. Again, if I use my fluid color on here, you can kind of see how as I go, that texture really plays with the fluid paint or even the high flow. 
If I wanted to mix this with my paint, I could easily do that, but I like the surface just to paint on. You get lots of texture there. So you can see that texture kind of poking through. And of course, the more I water this down, um, the more water I use and do more of a wash across that surface, you can really see um, that the product, the coarse alumina, kind of poking through there. So another great one for creating lots of texture, coarse alumina. All right, then three more grounds to look at. Um, and these three have acrylic counterparts. So the first up uh, is light dimensional ground. Um, light dimensional ground, this one is designed for our watercolor. Um, the light dimensional ground um, in the acrylic line is our light molding paste. And then we have our cold pressed ground which is our fiber paste with um, some added extra titanium white in there. And then we have our watercolor ground, much like our absorbent ground. And so here I've applied them in three different bands. We have the light dimensional ground. Then we have the cold press ground, which is the same as the fiber paste. And we have our watercolor ground. All right. So I got those laid out. I'm going to apply a little bit of watercolor and our fluid and our high flow just so you again can see um, just like the acrylic line these are designed for watercolor but we can use those for water media and acrylics as well. So that's with our watercolor and if I do a little wash of water on there. You can see all three slightly different for absorbency and all give you unusual or different mark make, making uh, abilities. And then a little bit of our high flow. And again, if I wanted to draw on these and combine them with uh, washing or watercolor, I could do that. And the fiber paste um, or cold press, you can see, has a lot more texture um, versus something like the absorbent ground. Um, so again, lots of possibilities for all of these. So uh, when you kind of show up at the store um, and you're like not sure what you want to do, just think of the grounds as kind of that connective tissue between your painting, um, your substrate where you're going to paint on your canvas and your paint. If you have any questions, make sure you drop those into the chat. Uh, I apologize, we lost our audio there temporarily, but hopefully we have that landing page there so you'll be able to go find lots of detailed information about the different types of grounds and mediums that we have for creating texture, for painting on, and for drawing on. Thank you for watching. Again, if you have questions, email us at help at goldenpaints.com. Thank you.